Welcome back to World History. Today, we're learning about Chapter 15, and we are in Japan. Let's go. All right, so in Japan, we got a new place. We're always going to start off with geography. It's back, and we've got islands. So if you think islands, you should already kind of have a little bit of idea of what we're talking about. Um, you know, what? how's the island going to affect you? What are you going to be good at? What are you going to eat? Things of this nature. What's gonna? What? How's the island bad? Island is good. You got a lot of access to food from the ocean. Island is bad. Why? Might be difficult to trade. Something along those lines. Okay. Uh, we'll talk about the emperor and clans and courts. We've got something called Zen. Okay, it's kind of like a Zen Buddhism. And then we'll maybe get to it this time or next time. Probably next time we'll talk about the difference between a samurai and a ninja. All right. So today, how does geography shape Japan? Ocean life and isolation. Uh, what countries greatly influence Japan? Their neighbors, okay, Korea and China. And then who writes early Japanese literature? Noble women, all right? And so we'll talk more about why that is. So for you, if you don't know where Japan is, take a look at this world map, and it's these islands over here, okay? Everybody sees Japan? Very good. Now I've got a question for you. Here are the islands, here's Japan. If I said, where is Tokyo gonna be? Where's the biggest city on this island gonna be? I want you to take a guess. So real quick, I'm gonna pause for five seconds, look at this map, take your finger, and point where you think Tokyo's gonna be. Okay, hopefully you guessed somewhere in this region. Okay, because you got a nice flat plain, you've got access to this river, Okay, if you said something else, that's okay, but I want you to see that this is the biggest plane on the island, and so that makes sense. Again, now your turn. I showed you where Japan is, you show me. Where's Japan? Touch the screen. There you go, right over in here. Okay, very good. So here's a topographical map of Japan. What do you notice? Lots of mountains, okay, lots of uh, volcanic mountains. And with volcanoes and islands, you're going to get something. You're going to get earthquakes. Okay? Uh, Japan is made up of islands, which are tops of volcanoes. We just talked about it. People mostly live in the flatlands. That makes sense. It's easier to grow crops when the land is flat. Very good. By the way, please note we got North Korea and South Korea over here, okay? And China over here. So you can kind of see that those are the neighbors. And although Russia's over here, most of Russia we associate with. Uh, what are you going to eat? Stuff out of the ocean, okay? Shark, octopus, seaweed, whatever you can catch from the ocean. Very good. The ocean floods. Dun, dun, dun. All across northern Japan, they felt it. A violent magnitude 9.0 earthquake on March 11, 2011. It was centered about 80 miles offshore, and tsunami warnings went up immediately. In coastal cities, people knew what to do next, run to higher ground. It's from these vantage points on hills and in tall buildings that incredible footage was captured. In Kesanuma, people retreated to a high-rise rooftop and could only watch in horror as tsunami waves inundated their city knocking buildings into rubble and mixing into a kind of tsunami soup filled with vehicles, building parts, and contents. Seawater cascaded over sea walls and into cities. This video shows the water rushing over an 18-foot seawall into Kamaishi City. The seawall here was the world's deepest and largest, but not enough for the magnitude of the March 11 disaster. It was the largest quake ever known in Japan and one of the five largest recorded in the world. More than 28,000 people are confirmed dead or missing. When two tectonic plates push together under the sea, the resulting earthquake sends an enormous burst of energy up through the ocean, displacing enormous quantities of water. With the upward motion, a series of waves expands in all directions. In deep water, these waves travel fast, up to 500 miles an hour, but only reach a height of a few feet. A passing ship might not even notice. 
But as the waves enter shallow waters, friction with the ocean floor lowers the wave's speed but raises their height. This video is from a Japan Coast Guard ship confronting a tsunami wave in shallow water on March 11. And a rare view from the air, video of a tsunami wave approaching the shoreline. In Japan, some tsunami waves reach as far as three miles inland. Japan may be the most seismologically studied country in the world, and with more than 1,200 high-precision GPS stations, a geophysicist at the University of Alaska used the data to create a visualization of the March 11 quake. The waves of displacement that you see were moving as fast as five miles per second. In this photo, the ripples of tsunami waves are seen moving upstream in the Naka River at Hitachi Naka City. New technology left an enormous amount of visual evidence for study in years to come and can perhaps help us better understand the power of earthquakes and tsunamis and prevent loss of life in the future. All right, so Japan has earthquakes. These earthquakes can cause tsunamis. I think we talk about it later, but the one tsunami hit the nuclear reactor and it messed it up. That happened at Fukushima. And so they have a big um, impact on Japan. So let's go to the Ainu. They are not actually considered Japanese, but they're some of the earliest people in Japan. We don't know where they come from, somewhere in Russia, maybe Siberia. But they're going to be driven back and onto the island of, how, how do you pronounce that, Hokkaido? Hopefully, hopefully I pronounced that right. And I do want to mention where that island is. It's right up here. All right. So in Japan, it's fragmented for a very long time. You have a lot of different clans. I'm never going to make you memorize every clan. But in similar, you know, we in China, we had... 
period of disunion or the warring states period, we have um, a period where there's not a centralized government and you have a lot of warlords. And what do you get when you have a lot of warlords? You usually get a lot of violence, okay? And then also, uh, it's hard to trade. So they're going to have clans. They're going to have uh, a dis, you know, dispersed power. Here's what it looks like. Okay, Japan is not unified. Look at how many different clans there are, ruled by, you know, a hundred or so clans. Okay, it's part religion, it's part something else. It reminds me sometimes of animism from Africa, or maybe even our Native Americans with the bear dance and with the, um, you know, believing that trees have spirits, something like that. Okay. Hopefully, again, pronouncing this right. Kami? Is it Kami or Kami? Not sure. Nature spirits, though. Everything has a spirit. The waterfall, the sun, the tree, etc. And this is a religion in Japan at the time. Okay. Shinto and Shintoism. It's ceremony. It's ritual cleansing. It's, again, part of the religious tradition. Okay. Let's take a look real quick at the samurai society that's developing and you notice here who's the most powerful on this list it's not the emperor it's the shogun okay and so the emperor is kind of the headpiece but the shogun really runs the show and that way you know if you do attack and you end up killing the emperor you're not actually taking out the power structure because the shogun is who runs the show below the shogun you have uh, the Daimo, who's running the samurai. The samurai are the warriors. There are some, we haven't studied the medieval knights of Europe, but there are some similarities between samurai and knights. And then most people are peasants. They're poor and they have no power. Here's everything I just showed you, but now in a fun little colored drawing, you have the emperor on top, but the real power is the shogun. Then you have your samurai. And this put merchants below peasants. You usually don't see that. You usually see peasants at the bottom. Do you remember where else we saw merchants very low? Do you remember? In India. Kind of interesting. Okay. Prince Shitoku goes to Japan, excuse me, goes from Japan to China and brings back elements of Chinese culture. What types of things have we learned about from China that he might bring back? What do you think? Okay, Buddhism, Confucianism, hopefully you got Confucianism. He also wants the emperor to be more powerful. I mean, he's a prince, he's going to probably be emperor. He wants to be the real power. We're talking about some art and culture. Why do you think rich women are going to be able to be the first writers? Why do you think that? Okay, maybe they, have, they don't have a job. Maybe uh, they can be supported by their husband. How about they can go to school and learn how to write? Does this make sense? Okay, it kind of gives you a little bit of a window into Japanese society. And so um, this lady, again, I'm pronouncing Shikibu, going for it, okay? But she writes the tale of Genji, and it's the world's first novel, not just Japanese novel, but the world's first novel. And it's in your book, and I want you to read a little bit of it. Let's just say visual art, not visual art. I'll fix that in post. Uh, the Tale of Genji, that's coming up here in a minute. Zen, it's an offshoot of Buddhism. It involves self-discipline, meditation, quiet thinking, um, things of that nature. It, it's sort of a mix of Buddhism and Taoism. In my, in my, that's my, in my interpretation. Here's the Tale of Genji. Make sure you read it in your book, page 452. And when we come back next time, we talk about samurai and ninja. See you soon.